Hello, this webinar is titled The Cycle of Freedom, Validated by History, and it's a part of the Cycle of Freedom series. Well, we've used this Cycle of Freedom so far, and I've made the observation that people can usually pick a word out in a few seconds. We've taken a look at these words, and we've even taken an assessment of where the United States finds itself today, and it's pretty sobering. Sobering enough that it raises this question, is this cycle of freedom really validated by history? Well, in this webinar, we're going to go back deeper into history and see if, in fact, it is validated by historical observation and in reality. Bill Moyers, a popular commentator on PBS, says this, we Americans seem to know everything about the last 24 hours, but very little of the past 60 years, or nothing, of the last 60 centuries. So we live without the wisdom of the ages. This Goethe quote that I've used before really puts it into context. He who cannot draw on 3,000 years is living hand to mouth. So let's use this benchmark and go back 3,000 years in world history. I take you to the era of the Judges, 1420 B.C., 3,200 years ago. The people group in the era of Judges were in transition from nomadic culture to one with structured organizations and institutions. A republic of 12 tribes that would work together to defend themselves, but other than that, they were free to live their lives as they saw fit. This worked well while they were a virtuous people. But when they abandoned their virtue, things went badly, and their society fell into chaos. In fact, a repeated phrase in the book of Judges says this, Every man did what was right in his own eyes. So using our cycle of freedom framework, when they were virtuous, they lived on the left side of the framework. When they lost their virtue and no longer adhered to a standard of right and wrong, every man did what was right in his own eyes and they lived on the right side of the framework of freedom. So let's leave this period of history and jump forward almost a thousand years to Xenophon, 430 BC. Well, who was Xenophon? Well, Xenophon was a Greek. He was an historian, a soldier, and mercenary, and a student of Socrates, and wrote extensively about the Peloponnesian Wars. Osgidinus, a student of history and of Xenophon, summarizes his thoughts in this. Athenian democracy became so corrupt that the people cried out that it was monstrous to stop them doing whatever they pleased. Tradition had so little authority, law so little restraint, and virtue so little appeal that the rights of the minority and the responsibilities of the majority were all disregarded equally. You can hear the echo from a thousand years before. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. Well, jumping forward a few centuries, 2,200 years ago, Polybius made these observations. Polybius was a Greek historian. He lived in the Roman Empire. He gave a detailed history of the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, and his thinking influenced the founding fathers of America. And again, Osgenus summarizing Polybius' thoughts. In fact, there is an ordained decay and change, or a natural cycle of constitutional revolutions as nations rise, prosper, and fall. Anyone who understands this cycle of growth, zenith, and decadence is able to follow what is the regular cycle of constitutional revolutions. Osgenis summarizes, The cycle of change is so clear and observable that if anyone takes the trouble to understand it and its causes, they would be able to apply the insight to the history of any nation and assess accurately when the nation is in, a, in its cycle of growth or decline at any moment. And then finishing with Polybius, he perhaps may make a mistake as to the dates at which this or that will happen to a particular constitution, but he will rarely be entirely mistaken as to the stage of growth or decay at which it has arrived, or as to the point at which it will undergo some revolutionary change. Jumping forward another hundred years, Polybius leaves the scene and Cicero appears on the scene 2100 years ago. Cicero was a Roman. He is a philosopher, a pol politician, a lawyer, an orator, a political theorist, a consul, and a constitutionalist. And again, summarized by Oz Guinness, some Cicero thoughts. It is a thing singular. The more these states have of security, the more, like waters excessively tranquil, they are subject to corruption. Worse still, when success breeds prosperity, and prosperity luxury, and luxury prevails, it marks the end for a republic. 
Doesn't that sound like he's describing this part of the cycle? Abundance, leisure, selfishness, and complacency? Thus, in a classic statement of how more is less when it comes to freedom, the more they draw advantage from their liberty, the more they approach the moment when they will lose it. Now to get even more specific, let's use Cicero's own words from a writing, The Commonwealth of Marcus Tullius Cicero. And I'll use this quote in the cycle of freedom right before our very eyes. When a commonwealth, after warding off many great dangers, has arrived at a high pitch of prosperity and undisputed power, it is evident that by the lengthened continuance of the great wealth within it, and this quote continues, but right now he's describing abundance. A society becomes prosperous and undisputed power. It has abundance. That the manner of life of its citizens will become more extravagant, and you move from abundance to leisure, and that the rivalry for office and in other spheres of activity will become fiercer than it ought to be. And that moves a society toward selfishness. Continuing, and as this state of things goes on more and more, the desire of office and the shame of losing reputation, as well as the ostentation and extravagance of living, moves a people from selfishness to complacency. And this will prove the beginning of a deterioration. And so he's describing this right side of the cycle as we move down to apathy, where, de de where deterioration really sets in. And of this change, the people will be credited with being the authors when they become convinced that they are being cheated by some Erevis and are puffed up with flattery by others from love of office. And so they'll move toward dependency because those in office will flatter them and will guarantee them that they'll have their fair share and that they'll be equal. And this makes them dependent on the gift givers that hold political office. For when that comes about in their passionate resentment and acting under the dictates of anger, they'll refuse to obey any longer or to be content with having equal powers with their leaders. At this point they move to a state of weakness. And he finishes... But they will demand to have all or far the greatest themselves. And from that point of weakness, as they demand that, this is what will transpire. And when that comes to pass, the Constitution will receive a new name, which sounds better than any other in the world, liberty or democracy. But in fact, it will become that worst of all governments, mob rule. And these people will sink in to a state of bondage once again. So this is how Cicero describes the right side of the cycle of freedom, ultimately leading people into a state of bondage. Fast forward to our founding father, George Washington, and his farewell address. Can it be that providence has not connected the permanent felicity of a nation with its virtue? Here he is simply and concisely speaking to the positiveness of the left-hand side of this cycle of freedom. Only this would prevent our nation from running the course which has hitherto marked the destiny of nations. And here he's speaking to the right side of the cycle of freedom. The fact that so many nations and people groups have always walked down the right side of that path. And he points to the specific key being the left-hand side of faith, courage, strength, and liberty. And yet, as we've already assessed, this is under direct assault in the public sphere in our day and age. And so as we wrap up, let's take a quote from Os Guinness from A Free People's Suicide. At the core of the classical understanding was an acute sense of historical irony and an assumption that is the exact opposite of most peoples today. Nations are most vulnerable, not when they are weak, but when they are strong. For unless guarded vigilantly, prosperity leads to hubris, the presumption of invulnerability, hubris to folly, and folly to nemesis or self-induced judgment. The moment of success is the moment to be most vigilant. Careless celebration is rife with mortal peril. So in my own survey of people, groups, city, states, and nations, I have found that the following fit this pattern to varying degrees. The Hebrew Republic, the Midianite peoples, Athens, Greece, Sparta, Greece, Rome, the Anglo-Saxons, Germany, France, Scotland, Ireland, England, Netherlands, Jamestown, Virginia, Plymouth, Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Bay and New England colonies, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, 
Ethiopia, East Germany, Romania, Poland, Russia, Ukraine, Belarusia, and Latvia all have found themselves at various points in times as people, groups, or nations on this cycle of freedom. And to close one last time with this Oz Guinness quote, This cycle of change is so clear and observable that if anyone takes the trouble to understand it and its causes, they would be able to apply the insight to the history of any nation and assess accurately where the nation is in its cycle of growth or decline at any moment. Indeed, are we willing to apply the truths of history in this cycle of freedom and look for its causes and correct course? My name's Craig Seibert. Thanks for listening.